Well, it's good to be with you today. Uh, we are actually going to be doing something today uh, that is interesting uh, because we're going to talk a passage uh, about a passage of scripture that the earliest manuscripts don't have in the Bible, but it's a story that is familiar to everybody. Okay, and likely it's in your Bible, it's in my Bible, it's in most Bibles. But if you look, there's always a footnote that will say in the earliest Greek manuscripts, this is not included in the text, all right? Uh, still, it's a wonderful story. Uh, it's a story that I think has beautiful truths in it. Uh, and when we begin to connect it to the rest of, rest of the passage that, uh, that the, uh, the people that put the Bible together, that they, that they put it in, it, it connects in ways, and we're going to pull out those verses and show how it connects. But I just wanted to let you know that, uh, just as for your own learning. And uh, uh, the other thing that we want to, to talk about is, is uh, we don't know who this woman is, okay? We don't know. Uh, th there is some speculation uh, about who this woman is, but the identity of this woman is not known, and Scripture in terms of extra biblical material, it identifies this woman, but scripture does not. And uh, so with scripture, we don't know who this woman is. And it's uh, John chapter 7, verses 53 through 8, 11 is where we are today. And it's about the woman that is caught in adultery. And there's some interesting things we're going to learn. Uh, the title of this sermon, I had fun with this. I think I, uh, after I sent this to Chrissy a couple days later, I thought, you know, I think I titled a sermon this a few years ago, but it was a, a different topic. Uh, I don't even remember that one. So, but I remember the title a little bit. So, uh, John chapter 7, verses 53 through 8, 11. And uh, we'll just jump into it, and then we're going to connect it to other scriptures throughout the rest of chapter 8. This is a, chapter 8 is a very long chapter. They each went to their own homes, and uh, incidentally, this, is, uh, this story takes place uh, right after Jesus teaches in the temple, and uh, and he tells people that uh, they should come to him and eat his flesh and drink his blood if they want eternal life. He does that, remember, because he's just fed the 5,000. Many, many people are following him for wrong reasons, and so he says that to narrow the crowd down. And now we have this story. This story also takes place in the temple. They each went to their own homes, and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, placing her in the center of the group. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? Okay, now let's stop there, all right? A woman is caught in adultery. The law of Moses in Leviticus says it is a capital offense, meaning it's punishable by death. But the method of death varies upon the teaching of Moses for how the adultery takes place. Okay? If a woman is either married or engaged to be married and she is caught in the act of adultery... The way that she is supposed to be killed is through strangulation. All right? Uh, if a man and a woman are caught in the act of adultery, uh, which we, we would say is fornication, because the woman is not married, whether the man is married or not, if the woman is not married, both the man and the woman are to be stoned. Okay, so what this shows us is that this crowd that is bringing this woman to Jesus is a bloodthirsty crowd. All right, because they have brought this woman, they have not brought the man, and they have not thought through fully the law of Moses, even if though they are referencing it, because they want to do the bloodiest thing possible. Okay, now. Act of stoning. How did stonings take place? And this is important because they try to stone Jesus towards the end of this story, okay? 
Stoning is somewhat different than we think of. We think of picking up rocks that may be the size of a softball and the person just gets stoned with those, you know, that we throw those at them. But that's not the way the stoning takes place. Stoning takes place where you find a, uh, according to the, Mish, uh, the Mishnah, which is the Jewish book, Jewish book of Laws, that's how, where we get this. This describes how stoning occurs. You take the person that is going to be stoned, you put them in a place, either you dig a pit or you put them at a location that is twice, that is the height of their body, okay? So for me, uh, they would put me somewhere that is, you know, roughly five foot, eight inches, six feet tall, something like that, five, foot, five six feet tall, okay? Yeah, thanks, Ashley, for laughing. All right, so, so they put me, put me somewhere, you know, where I'm about between five to six feet off the ground, all right? And then the person that is charged with killing me, okay, uh, would, would push me off of that ledge, and hopefully the fall would kill me, all right? That's what they're hoping, okay? Because I'd fall and break my neck, all right? If the fall doesn't kill me, they would flip me over, so I'm laying on my back, and they would take a giant boulder and roll it onto my chest, all right? If I'm still alive after that, joyous occasion, then all of the Israelite community takes the softball sized stones and throws them at me until I'm dead. Okay? That's the way a stoning takes place. And when Jesus gets ready to be stoned, it's interesting. We're going to talk about how, how is that going to happen because he's in the temple. It's really interesting. And we'll, we'll get into that. Okay? So, this woman, they, uh, this crowd, they're not even thinking through everything. All right? They, they just want Jesus to redo the law of Moses or come up with something on the fly. So that they could not kill the woman, but kill who? Jesus. And they try to kill Jesus at the end of the chapter. All right? So they are a bloodthirsty crowd that is out for the death of Jesus. And so they bring this woman. And uh, what do you say? Verse 6. They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground... With his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. Let's stop there. So I'm studying this, this passage uh, for my devotions this week. I started going through the Gospel of John a few weeks ago, and uh, maybe about a month or, or more and I'm, I'm, th I'm through this passage, and I'm reading it, and uh, I'm thinking about it, and all of a sudden, it hits me, and I'm sure it's hit you too, that Jesus never judges anyone. Now, if you're wondering if that's true, let's go to verse 15. You judge according to human standards. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. You judge according to human standards, but I judge no one. And I thought to myself, no wonder Jesus tells me not to judge people, because he doesn't judge anyone. When is the last time you felt judged? For me, it's every time I go to the dentist. <laughs> I do not enjoy going to the dentist. I don't like it. And I'll tell you why. Because they judge me. I mean, I've even started flossing every other day, and they're still judging me. 
You know, when I was a kid, I didn't mind going to the dentist, and now I realize why. Because they judge my parents. That's why I wasn't judging me. I get the toy out of the box, right? But they're always judging someone, and why is the dentist judging? Because that's how they make money. When the dentist tells you, oh, you know, you better do this, that, or the other, and then the next time, if you don't do this, that, or the other, and they see you again, oh, we told you, you should have done this, that, or the other. <laughs> and so I am at the dentist, I'm at the dentist this week for the second time because I had some cavities and because uh, <clears throat> I wasn't flossing <clears throat> like I should have. And because uh, I don't want to be judged. You know, I, uh, I like judging. I, I like judging people. I don't know if any of you do. I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, you, may, you may not be, but uh, I am. So we, were, so we were going to church this morning, and uh, one of the things I learned uh, is that um, if, if a police officer is, is, does not have their lights on, and they run a stop sign or a traffic light, technically, technically, they could be ticketed. All right, do you know who could ticket them? Well, if you could get them to pull over, you could. All right. Now here's the challenge with that, right? So I saw a sheriff go through, a Williamson County Sheriff go through a light, and I'll tell you why he went through the red light, because he was trying to get in line and beat traffic to the line to get gas from the Shell station, all right? So he goes through the light, and I told Ashley, I, you know, we're on the way to church, I'm talking about judging, and so I'm, you know, I'm judging, and uh, so I said, you know, Ashley, I said, uh, I, said I, can pull, I can pull him over. I can him a ticket. She said, how are you going to pull him over? So I don't know. So maybe I can flash my lights. I, said, I, don't, I don't know, but it's the law. It's the law, all right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and we judge. We judge all the time. And something that I have been convicted on by Jesus in this passage this week, as I've been spending my time with Jesus, is that I need to stop judging. Because if the Bible tells me, if Jesus says in his own words, that I judge no one, I shouldn't judge either. Now let's back up because I know that I know this is really hard. Okay, I this is this is hard for me to understand. I'm assuming it's hard for you because there is sin involved. So what does Jesus do with this sin? Okay, so let's jump back, Tom, to the previous verses, and we're going to see Jesus address that. Jesus uh, also. Uh, Interestingly enough, well, let me let me go here and then we'll jump. Okay, so we how do we know that Jesus uh, doesn't judge her? All right, because he says, uh, "Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on don't sin anymore." But how do we know that Jesus believes that she was sinning? Well, because Jesus knows that she was sinning. You see, it's true, the woman was caught in an act of adultery, all right? The woman was sinning, but Jesus does not become her judge, even though he knows she's guilty. Who does Jesus become? We talked about it this last week. He becomes her advocate, okay? Because he says, Neither do I condemn you. You see, if Jesus had been judging her, she would have received a penalty. But because Jesus did not judge her, because Jesus leaves the judging to God, Jesus gives her grace and encourages her to leave a life of sin. So how does this play out through the rest of the story? Let's go to verse 26, which is right at the next slide here. Jesus says, so what happens after this? And I, I didn't put up the whole chapter because the whole chapter is, is uh, 59 verses. That's a lot. You can go home and read it this afternoon. But basically what happens is Jesus continues to teach in the people. And uh, the Jewish leaders and him, they, they talk about, you know, he, he talks to them more about judging and they're questioning him. They say, how can you judge? And he says, I don't judge. Only my father judges. And they say, well, who is your father? 
and, and then there is this whole altercation based on who Jesus' father is and the fact that the religious leaders don't believe him. And so, verse 26, Jesus says, I have many things to say in judgment concerning you. The one who sent me is true, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Now, what is interesting is that even though Jesus says he has many things to say in judgment concerning you, do we see Jesus saying those things and judging those religious leaders? No. So this is the first clue of what we do when we have that impulse in our hearts, which I have, you, you might have it, probably have it, maybe less than me, but when I want to judge somebody, what do I do? What do I do? Remember last week we talked about how we have uh, the accuser, you know, Hasatan, Satan, the accuser, who is uh, who's always bombarding us, causing us to try to sin. You know, Jesus earlier in the book of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, tells us not to judge or what? Or we will be judged, right? And he tells us to remove the plank from our eye before we take care of the sawdust in our brother's eye. Incidentally, have any of you ever had sawdust in your eyes? I'll tell you what, that is some painful, that is a painful experience, all right? It is bad. In fact, uh, a few years ago when, when we were, when I was building my office, um, I, had, I had been doing some cutting uh, for some of the, trimming some of the fascia, and uh, it was some cedar, and I had gotten this cedar dust in my eye, and I texted my brother-in-law, who was uh, still doing um, a cabinet making at the time, I said, how do you get sawdust out of your eye? And he said, well, he said, you really, he said, you can try to wash it out with water, but he said, honestly, your eyes just have to work it out. And he said, eventually, once you've worked with it long enough, you don't even notice it's there. Which I thought was interesting, because when we have sawdust in our eyes long enough, we won't even realize that our problems are there anymore. There was a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, someone posted on LinkedIn the other day, that, that who was a German theologian in World War II, that was part of the Valkyrie plot uh, to kill Hitler, and he was hanged as a result at, uh, right at the end of World War II uh, by Hitler, a week before the war ended. And uh, one of the things he said is the, the ideal of Christianity is that we will have disillusionment with other people, okay? Now, in his disillusionment, well, listen, okay? Disillusionment with other people, disillusionment, hopefully, with Christians, and by the grace of God, disillusionment with ourselves. What is he saying? Basically, he's saying... By the grace of God, when we follow Jesus, we will be disillusioned at how awful people are. With an increased grace of Christ, we will be disillusioned with how bad Christians are. And with the most grace from God possible, we will be disillusioned with how we are. And then, Jesus can begin to come in and change us. Jesus says, I have many things to say in judgment concerning you. The one who sent me is true. What I have heard from him, I tell the world. So when we have this impulse, this inclination to judge another, I think the first thing we can do is just to keep our mouths shut. Be still. Yeah. Be quiet. You know. Realize that it is not our role to judge. It is God. It is God the Father's role to judge. It is not even Jesus' role to judge. Why is it not Jesus' role to judge? Because that's not how the court is set up. Jesus is our lawyer. He's not our judge. And so he continues in this passage, and this passage goes into who are the children of Abraham, and Jesus tells all of the people there in the synagogue 
that are listening to him. He says, uh, he says, none of you are the children of Abraham. Your father is the devil. And they say, no. They say, now we know that you are a Samaritan, which is basically uh, the, the person in your heart that you are most prejudiced against. You don't, don't tell me. Don't tell your neighbor. All right. You know, the person in your heart that you are most prejudiced against. That's the way that they're saying to Jesus. They're most prejudiced against any other people group than Samaritans. So they decide to call Jesus a Samaritan. And then they say, and we know you have a demon, all right? Now listen to this. Jesus does not throw the Samaritans under the bus. Jesus doesn't say, no, I'm not a Samaritan. Jesus says, I do not have a demon. Because he's already identified with the Samaritans. Remember, the story of the woman at the well has taken place in chapter 4 of this gospel. So Jesus says, I don't have a demon. And then this is the last thing, next to last verse for us. Verse 50, he says, I'm not trying to bring glory to myself. There's one who is seeking to glorify me, and he's the judge. Now, this is good news for the people that I want to judge, for the people that you want to judge, because what Jesus is saying is that God, our Father, is the judge. So when we are inclined to judge another, we must remember that that is not our role because we didn't create that person. God the Father created that person. Now I know that Paul in, the, in Corinthians tells us if a brother is sinning, confront him to his face so he doesn't continue to sin. I agree with that. I believe in that scripture. I don't believe that that scripture contradicts this, okay? The reason being, very quickly, and maybe we'll, we'll teach on that uh, in the weeks to come, um, but very quickly, the reason being is that Paul is speaking about a relationship in which a Christian community has invited one another to maintain accountability to Christian growth, okay? That, that, is a, that is a specific instance where a church community, which is what a church community is supposed to be, a group of people that have invited one another to judge each other equally, okay, and to help each other, all right, not just a, us talking down, okay, it's a different circumstance. Very important, but it's a different circumstance. And so Jesus is saying, look, when you see that person and you want to judge them and you know they should be judged, and you know what? You're probably right in the judgment you're making against them. Were, were the religious leaders right that the woman was caught in adultery? Was she committing that act? Yeah. Had they judged accurately? Yes, they had. And yet Jesus didn't judge her. He advocated for her because he didn't condemn her. And so the discourse continues and the Jewish people get more and more mad. And watch what happens in verse 59, because the Jewish leaders have come to commit a stoning, and they are going to have their stone. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Where did they find stones if they were in the temple? So I did some little bit of research on this this week, and the temple at this time is Herod's temple. And the temple has not yet been constructed. It is under construction. And the construction materials that the temple is being made out of are rather large stones. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll see the base of the temple where the Jewish wailing wall is. And around the, each of those stones on the Jewish wailing wall is a little, uh, a little bit of an edge, just like a little bit of the edge on this TV. And that marks the stones, that Her that's the mark that Herod had his craftsmen making the stones, okay? So all of these stones and all of this building material is in piles in the temple. And so the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, are right there with all of this building material. And they decide if, if they can't stone that lady, they really wanted to stone Jesus. And so they pick up the stones, and they're about ready to push Jesus off the ledge and throw the big stone on his chest, and then all come in with their other stones. 
And then something mysterious happens, and this I can't even explain. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. I don't know if Jesus went invisible. I don't, Jesus, I don't know if Jesus went like vision on Avengers and just walked through the walls. You know, I, I don't know how he did it. I don't know if, if an angel hit him. I don't know how he did it, but somehow Jesus hid himself and he escaped. And we see this happening another time. Remember, they're going to push him off a cliff in Nazareth and he hides himself and escapes as well. <clears throat> but what was so fascinating to me in this passage is that, number one, I judge people too much. I don't know if you do, but maybe you do. Number two, Jesus doesn't judge people. Scripture tells us that. He advocates for them. Number three, everyone will get judged, and God will be the judge. And so this week, as you move into this week, I want you to remember when the uh, when you're going through line and check out and the person is purchasing something that you don't agree with or the person, you know, is uh, is talking about diabetes already and they got, you know, 20, 24 cases of Coca-Cola that's not Diet Coke, you know, it's not your place to judge. Not your place to judge. Now, if they come into your office and you're a physician, yeah, that's your job, right? Your job is to judge at that point, all right? And in the checkout line, it's also the dentist. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, see ya. <laughs> so, uh, so don't don't judge. Let Jesus be the. Let God be the judge. See, it's so easy. Let Jesus be the judge. Jesus isn't the judge. See how programmed I am. Maybe too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this story, this passage that tells us that Jesus is not the judge. That you, Father, are the judge. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.